a, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to be here. And, uh, and I will say in uh, preamble, uh, Nadine is a real pleasure to work with. This is the third event the ILS has uh, sponsored with her. But she does have one demand. She insists that her books be available for sale at her talks for people who come to, uh, to see them. So I have a box of books with me. And I would like to, I'm flying back to Ottawa tonight. I would like to fly back with as few as possible. So I'm willing to sell them below cost. $27.50 on Amazon, if you have $20, either cash or we can work out a credit card payment through our website, come talk to me after, be happy to give you a book and I think Nadine would probably be happy to, uh, to sign it. The book I think is, is very timely and is important, uh, makes my question, first question very easy. Why did you decide to write this book? I decided to write this book because I am passionately concerned about every single one of the issues that is flagged in the title. Starting with the main title, Hate, it is a problem that has been rearing its ugly head all over my country, all over the world. We see manifestations everywhere. And I really am very concerned about what is the most effective way to resist it, which is the only verb in my book title. And by the way, I am concerned not only about increasing manifestations of hatred and discrimination and stereotyping, including violent crimes, of which I need not uh, tell you we have examples seemingly every week. I'm also concerned about the proliferation of language that uses the H word, it seems to me, more and more profligately to describe anybody that with whom we have any disagreement at all. Uh, so in terms of the term hate speech, which in the United States we have no legal term that is recognized because unlike Canada and so many other countries, my Supreme Court has never recognized a category of speech based on its hateful or hated content and said, therefore, it's unprotected. But basically, people tend to use the term hate speech to refer to any speech that they dislike for any reason. And that is of great concern to me, not only as somebody who is passionately committed to freedom of speech, but also as somebody who is passionately committed to human rights and equality and dignity, inclusivity, diversity, social justice, all of the wonderful causes that are hoped to be addressed by restricting hate speech. But in my view, studying all the evidence of how anti-hate speech laws have worked, uh, have not worked to be more accurate, um, they actually have done more harm than good for those very important causes. So I felt really driven to write the book as I saw more and more student activists in my country and your country and around the world who are wonderfully crusading for social justice. That is a very positive development. But there's so much anecdotal evidence and so much survey evidence that indicates that student activists and others who are committed to social justice believe that freedom of speech is their enemy rather than what I am absolutely convinced it is, and that is the time-tested and essential ally. So clearly, you know, it's a point of view that I had been espousing and experiencing through my own human rights crusading throughout my lifetime, but clearly I had not made that case, nor had other advocates of free speech and human rights made that case sufficiently persuasively to the current generation of campus activists. So I took it as a challenge, uh, wearing both of my hats. I'm a full-time professor. And by the way, the whole time I was president of the ACLU, I was also a full-time professor. Uh, many people are not aware that the uh, presidency of the ACLU is a volunteer position. So I did that on top of being a law professor. And being as both an advocate and an educator, I really wanted the opportunity to explain and to advocate 
uh, why those of us who are committed to social justice have a real stake in making sure that government does not have power to punish speech that some people consider to be hateful. Right. So I would say that uh, if I had said to you five or, or ten years ago, uh, made a reference to sort of the campus free speech wars. You probably would have thought back to maybe the 1960s and, and people who uh, I think would have been identified with the political left speaking out and, and defending that right to free speech. And now it seems, at least to a certain extent in some places, that that is almost inverted mm -hmm. and that people on the political left are, uh, at least in some cases, skeptical about free speech. Uh, do you have any thoughts about how that came to be and, and why that inversion took place? I, I think for most people, it is very instinctive to want to silence whatever ideas we hate or disagree with, right? It takes a long time to explain to people. So I'll give you an example. The classic case for not only the ACLU's advocacy, but for American law is the so-called Skokie case. I'm, have any of you heard of that? Nobody has, so I get to explain. One person has, so bear with me. If I were a mean law professor, I would call on you and say, tell us what it was about. Uh, and if you want to, you may. But OK. <laughs> uh, so ba way back in 1977 and 78, my organization, the ACLU, which is almost 100 years old, and going back to its beginning, had advocated you know, full-throatedly for racial justice and against any kind of discrimination. And yet, we, from the beginning, also defended freedom even for the thought that we hate. And there I'm quoting a famous Supreme Court opinion. So we always defended freedom of speech, even for people who use their freedom to crusade for goals that were antithetical to our own civil liberties goals, uh, for the reason that once we give the government power to decide that some speech is so controversial, so wrongheaded, so offensive, so subversive, so dangerous that it should be silenced, that is an enormous subjective power that predictably is going to blow back and be used against speech that we love. And in fact, it's disproportionately going to be used against speech by people who are members of political or ethnic or other minority groups, right? Because by definition, we don't wield majoritarian power. Those who do are going to be pressured to use subjective power to silence our messages. So anyway, um, back in, the, uh, in 1977, there was a group of neo-Nazis who, who wanted to demonstrate in Skokie, Illinois, a Chicago suburb that has a large Jewish population, many of whom were Holocaust survivors. And the ACLU came to the defense of freedom of speech for those neo-Nazis. Now, I'm very clear to say that many people said, why is the ACLU, which is so committed to equality and so completely opposed to the Nazis' message, why are you defending the Nazis? We were not defending the Nazis. We were defending a neutral principle that we knew was essential for pro-civil rights demonstrators. And in fact, uh, all of the arguments that were made to censor the Nazis in Skokie, that their speech was insulting, that it was offensive, that it was subversive, that it was dangerous, all of those arguments had been made less than 10 years earlier in another town, also in Illinois, against Martin Luther King and civil rights demonstrators in Cicero, Illinois, their speech was seen as subversive, insulting, dangerous, threatening, and so forth. So the point is that um, lawyers, uh, I think, can understand this perhaps uh, because we're schooled in it, to look through the particular speech, the particular facts, and see an underlying principle that will equally protect exactly the opposite message. But it's counter, it's counterintuitive. 
There is a journalist in the United States who wrote a book many years ago that really summarizes this instinct uh, to suppress ideas that we hate. His name is Nat Hentoff, and the book was called Freedom of Speech for Me, but Not for Thee, How the Left and Right Relentlessly Censor Each Other. So today, when uh, uh, in the United States, uh, campuses tend to be predominantly on the left end of the political spectrum, there have been many studies that have shown that. Not surprisingly, the unpopular speakers that people instinctively want to shut down because they hate the idea tend to be on the conservative end of the spectrum. And so unfortunately, if people are only looking at the speaker or the idea that is protected rather than the underlying principle, they could say, oh, this is a principle. Our, the freedom of speech belongs to these right-wing ideas that we disagree with. Now, I have to say that in my country, we have too many incidents where um, a speech on the left end of the political spectrum is also being silenced on campuses. It's not getting nearly as much publicity, and we can go into why that is, but it, uh, unfortunately that happens. Even tenured uh, liberal professors, progressive professors, have lost their jobs because of saying something that upsets those on the right end of the spectrum. Yeah. You know, you're, you're tempting me to be a really lazy interviewer because I was formulating the next question, but you said we could go into how that is, and I think that might be valuable. So why do you think it is that we're hearing a lot more about free speech violations uh, when it comes to conservative speakers, conservative voices, and, and perhaps not that degree uh, on the left? Again, here I'm speaking only for the United States. I do try to keep up as much as I can with what's going on in your country, but I'm not watching the, the, the media. In the United States, the right of center media have really made it a cause celeb uh, to target universities in general. So the attack on universities as allegedly um, disproportionately censoring um, and silencing views on the right is part of a larger crusade against universities that uh, I think is very dangerous and is threatening academic freedom. Uh, why it, but I, I also want to fault the so-called liberal media because they are not calling out censorship. They are ceding that issue to the right. And I think that's a very serious mistake. I did a panel about a year ago with a professor at Columbia University named Mark Lilla. Some of you may have read his recent book about identity politics. He's definitely a person of the left, as, as I certainly am myself, and he watches TV more than I do. So he called out, you know, we were being uh, filmed, and he looked at the camera, and he addressed all of the hosts of the uh, liberal TV shows, and he called them out one after another, and he said, what, shame on you, shame on you, shame on you. Why are you not making this an issue? Why are you not beating you know, Fox News and those on the right? You are handing over this issue to them. And by the way, I, I, I'm so sorry I have to say this, but we have a poisonous atmosphere in my country where the president has repeatedly called the media the enemy of the people. I completely defend his right and everybody's right to criticize the media, even in strong terms, but I think it's very dangerous when you have somebody with political power who has uh, threatened and in some cases used that power to undermine uh, the freedom of the press. I feel it's very important to say, even though I criticize many particular actions and judgments uh, that media make, I do not think they are the enemy of the people as an institution. I think we really need an independent media uh, in a democracy to be a channel of information and ideas and debate. So I think you and I are both unusual. Our student years are behind us, and yet we spend a fair amount of time with students. You're a professor. I do a lot of events like this for, uh, for students. And so sometimes when I speak to my peers who've been out of school for a while, 
and they say, I don't know what's wrong with students today. They're all snowflakes. They're all so upset. They're, they're getting triggered about, about these things. Why are they so sensitive? And why don't they just toughen up and ignore these things? Do you think that's a fair criticism? Absolutely not. I defend people's right to make it, but uh, I dissent. And I dissent based on a lot of experience. I speak at least on at least three or four campuses every single week, and that's been going on for two years now. I haven't added them up, but it's it's definitely in the hundreds. And I uh, begin every day by reading two newsletters about, specifically about campus developments inside higher ed and the Chronicle of Higher Education. And I am so grateful to uh, students here, and by the way, thank you, the students who organized this, uh, and all over the US and Canada and all over the world who I think are, are really give, I'm sorry, really give me hope as a human rights crusader because these students are so committed to liberty and justice for all. I was a, uh, what's now being called a social justice warrior. I know some people use that as a criticism. To me, that's a big compliment. And I was that way back when, before your parents were born in the uh, late 1960s and early 1970s in my student days. And uh, I've been kind of dispirited that in decades after that, again, in the United States, I wasn't following what was happening in Canada, um, survey after survey showed that students, by and large, were not even interested in being informed about political events, much less being actively engaged themselves. So the upsurge of activism that we've seen on campus starting in the US, it started around 2015, has been thrilling to me. And it's also been thrilling to see that in my country, this has translated into activism, not only on campus, but in the larger community. So we have much younger people who are not only voting and campaigning for candidates in unprecedented numbers, but they are candidates themselves in unprecedented numbers. Uh, and in the US, that has meant not only younger people, but much more diverse, just you know, many, many more women, members of racial and ethnic minority groups, of religious minority groups, and that's really very wonderful. Wonderful. Now, our, when you see public opinion surveys among students that a large percentage of them believe that hateful speech and speech that's offensive and insulting should be censored, that is completely characteristic of everybody of every age throughout history. So let's go back to the Skokie case, for example. In 1977, it was so unpopular for the ACLU to be defending freedom of speech for, in that particular case, for the Nazis, that it was a very easy case in the courts of law. We won, you know, hands down in every single court in which it was argued, including the United States Supreme Court. But in the court of public opinion, it was very unpopular to the extent that the ACLU itself lost 15% of our members. Yes, even people who were such die-hard free speech supporters that they joined the ACLU said, this is too much. We want to make an exception to free speech for Nazi speech. So to say that today's students, by having that sensitivity, are somehow different from everybody else, I think is really unfair. Wonderful. In just a minute, I'd like to open it up and have a conversation. I'm happy to take any, any questions from the audience. I, I will ask just one, one more question. We were at an event at McMaster University uh, earlier today, and there was a young woman with a rather lengthy statement. Um, but she, she was critical, and I, I think I could maybe identify at least one of her, her core concerns in that she was concerned that by being such a vocal spokesperson, for free speech and defending the rights of people to make offensive and sometimes hateful statements. That, uh, that uh, she was concerned that events of this type 
could embolden those sorts of people with those really objectionable views and, uh, and was concerned that therefore, uh, you know, I, I suppose we shouldn't do events of this type. So what would you say in response to that sort of criticism that even though you're not a proponent of, of hate speech, you are emboldening those who are by making the argument so forcefully for free speech? Uh, because the arguments in my book, which reflect evidence from countries around the world that do punish hate speech, that also reflect experience in the United States, which in the past punished hate speech, have absolutely convinced me that censorship does more harm than good. I absolutely agree that hate speech can do enormous harm. I think it doesn't necessarily do harm. And I'm very, just as I became discouraged about the ineffectiveness of censorship, I became encouraged about other steps that we can take that I think really will have a much more concrete impact in reducing both the existence of hate speech, the underlying attitudes that it reflects, and certainly the damage that it can potentially cause. But I, to, you know, to the best of my ability, I'm humble and say I, I don't know if I was able to be objective, but I really tried. Uh, I am so committed to countering hatred that uh, I believe that if I had been convinced that censoring even more hateful speech than is allowed to be uh, censored under US law, which I think does draw the line correctly, uh, if I had been convinced that more censorship would be effective uh, and, and, and effective in a way that no alternative measure would be, I think I would have been persuaded to support it. Uh, what was really striking to me, Matt, as I did the research and looked at assessments by human rights activists in so many other countries, including this one, and including at international and, and regional human rights agencies, how many of them have concluded putting aside free speech principles because under their laws, censoring hate speech is permissible. But just in terms of what is an effective way to make progress toward equality and dignity and diversity and inclusivity, they were all saying we should move away from censorship and more toward counter speech and anti-discrimination laws and anti-hate crime laws and empowering civil society. Uh, so uh, even assuming uh, you know, the, her premise about the harm, which many people debate that, uh, I would say the best way to counter the harm is not through censorship. Wonderful. I think that gives us a really nice idea of sort of the, the themes of the book and, and the foundation of your position. Love to open it up to questions. Anyone in the audience has, has any thoughts or comments they'd like to make? Please, in the blue shirt. So I was wondering how you think maybe we can restore a balance between um, the rights of free speech in, in the left and uh, in the right, because I mean, as you said, it goes back and forth. Um, but can we ever achieve peace? <laughs> and it's such an interesting question because I've been talking about this subject almost nonstop for two years, and. In the past year, more of my speaking invitations have been very much in that vein. Um, how do we improve civil discourse? How do we get people to talk to each other despite very strong differences? And sad but true, on many occasions, I have been asked to pick a conservative or an anti-civil, you know, somebody with whom my view, from whom my views are distinguished, and to model how we talk to each other about issues where we strongly disagree with each other. And, and to me, it's sad that this has to be an event. Um, and yet I've had responses from student audience members that it's so helpful and so surprising because they have not seen examples of that. And in the US, we're starting to, this is such a serious concern that we're starting to see foundations 
uh, fund a a whole departments and whole programs of study on campuses that are designed to foster civil discourse, civic engagement. We're seeing an outpouring of on campuses in the US um, organizations that are fostering that kind of dialogue and the skills to, uh, to, to bring it about. One organization is called the Heterodox Academy, as its name would suggest, it is designed to um, amplify the range of views that are exchanged. There's another organization, uh, one that I, I like because it was formed organically by students called Bridge. And as the name suggests, they uh, bridge the ideological differences by bringing together students and faculty members and others to talk about controversial issues. And people are writing about tech specific techniques to do this. Uh, it's, it's now kind of a cottage industry, which is very positive. Uh, the pendulum swings, right? And I think many, many people are very concerned about the pendulum having swung so much toward polarization and demonization and exile of anybody with whom you disagree at all, that now the pendulum is being pushed back. Uh, a new book that just came out that I'm reading and I find very good on this subject is by Arthur Brooks, who is the president of AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, and it's called Love, Love Your Enemies or Loving Your Enemies. And he interviewed the Dalai Lama and, and other people who are experts and not hate, but love. And um, he gives very concrete techniques for, for how we can have that kind of constructive dialogue. Please. Uh, my question would be uh, just, well, first I'll kind of like give the, the runway for the question. So I understand that we kind of have to have free speech to have the intellectual uh, discussions that we need to have. But a lot of the topics that have been hit with this uh, concern of free speech are very personal topics. So like gender identity, like identity of any kind, or uh, even about the case you're talking about, we're talking about a personal attack on maybe Jewish folk, for example. And so it kind of gets me thinking about uh, the role that feelings have to play when we're having conversation, like an intellectual conversation, because it can be about topics that are very personal to an individual, but they're still important uh, conversations to have. And so, and one thing that uh, the right doesn't do is that they don't consider the feelings. Like you have guys like Ben Shapiro saying stuff like facts don't care about your feelings, but feelings are still important because you really need to be able to manage them in order to really facilitate uh, an intellectual conversation, right? Like if someone is very upset or angry, uh, there's nothing, no amount of articulation can really change their mind mm -hmm. or even get them to change their mind because they're upset at you. Mm -hmm. They'll take anything, they'll pick anything that you say out of place and they'll disavow everything you say. Mm -hmm. And so my question would be is, uh, how do you get the right and the left, the left does a better job than the right, but mm -hmm. how do you get the right to at least acknowledge that, like you said, people need to be treated with a bit of dignity mm -hmm. and respect before mm -hmm. we can uh, open the floor to conversation? Uh, excellent question, and I want to say the ACLU has always been strictly nonpartisan. We never take a position for or against an entire party or candidate or official, but we'll issue criticism or praise on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. And believe me, whatever the problem is, you will find some examples of people all across the political spectrum that are um, manifesting that problem. So for example, it is true that, you know, just to use some politicians in my country, uh, Donald Trump certainly regularly says things that are extremely insulting to a whole host uh, of different people, including uh, people on the left that he disagrees with. But Hillary Clinton, when she was a candidate, used very hurtful language about a basket of deplorables. Mm -hmm. And even Barack Obama, which was quite surprising because he was very measured in his language. I admired that a lot about him. Uh, and to the, to the extent that some people criticized him for being too disciplined and too self-restrained and not emotional, Enough, but uh, you may remember one incident where he very strongly and hurtfully criticized people who were clinging to guns and God 
Um, and uh, yes, and you know that was hurtful to people to whom those are deeply cherished values. So all of us are capable. I'm sure, maybe not you, but probably all the rest of us have both been on both sides of it, said things that were hurtful to other people and have been very hurt by words ourselves. My uh, uh, Supreme Court has said that the fact that speech causes emotional distress, even if it intentionally causes emotional distress, is not a justification for punishing it if it is about a matter of public concern. And there's not a bright line distinction between those identity issues, which could not be more personal. I'm Jewish, I've been subjected to anti-Semitic epithets. I'm a female, I've been subjected to misogynistic speech. Uh, but even in the course of saying things that are terrible um, about, uh, about us as individuals, a political point is being made. Take the Skokie case. Uh, the Nazis in that case were marching with signs that said free speech for white people. Does that make their message any less repugnant to me? No, but it is a political message. And the Supreme Court has basically said more harm than good will be done if we allow speech to be punished because it causes emotional distress. Uh, and by the way, that is a doctrine that has definitely been really essential for protecting civil rights advocates in the United States. We had some historic cases in the 1960s where the civil rights movement could have ground to a halt because Southern um, opponents, mostly in this, there are plenty in the North too, but these early cases were in the South where they used every possible censorship strategy to shut down the uh, civil rights demonstrators. Uh, and there was one case where they saddled the NAACP, which was the major organization leading the struggle for civil rights and racial justice, saddled them with enormous damages uh, because of a speech that one of the leaders gave in which he was ranting against uh, white merchants who were you know, discriminating on the basis of race. And he said, you know, we're gonna boycott you. And if anybody breaks that boycott, we're gonna bust, break your damn neck. Uh, there was another case involving an African-American um, uh, who was protest, this was again in the 60s, who was protesting police abuse against African-American men on justified violence, including killing. Times haven't changed, unfortunately. And, um, and it, it was during the time of the Vietnam War with its draft, and he said, you know, if they ever draft me, the first person I'm gonna get in my, sh in my sights is LBJ, um, the president uh, at the time. And I can give you many other examples where the language was very upsetting and even smacked of violence. And, uh, and the Supreme Court said, no, that's hyperbole in, you know, in an impassioned debate and discussion and discourse and exhorting people to support your cause. We have to err in favor of allowing in more intemperate language. More harm would be done if we allowed the government, and, and the Supreme Court said, you know, we cannot convey our passions for these causes in polite and dulcet phrases. But I think we should be very sensitive to how we use language and always engage in self-restraint wherever we can to use language that's uh, maximally respectful of people's dignity and to accept their input if we say something that's not as respectful or, you know, that one of the things that, that really bothers me with all the self-censorship that's going on, people are walking on eggshells because they fear that if they say something that's unwittingly insensitive that they're gonna be immediately demonized as some kind of is or some kind of ope. I think we have to be a lot more forgiving. Uh, Blue hat the back. Um, are you aware of um, Congresswoman Elan Omar's uh, comments recently? Um, so do you think, but I think they're anti-Semitic, but do you think it was hate speech or free speech? Definitely free speech. Uh, I mean, if you're asking me what is punishable hate speech, I'm this, and I'm gonna take the question uh, in part as addressing that. 
Uh, I completely endorse the standards that we have in the United States, which say uh, the mere fact that we hate the idea is not a justification for censoring it. But if in a particular context, it, it directly causes certain imminent specific serious harm, such as a true threat or intentional incitement of imminent violence or targeted bullying or harassment, then it could be punished. Her speech was definitely in the first category. Even let's, some people debate whether or not it was anti-Semitic. Let's assume for the sake of argument it was. Um, and I do think there's a strong argument that it was, that would not be a justification for censoring it. That's a d justification for censuring it or criticizing it. And the first time uh, recently that she made such a comment when she talked about it's all about the Benjamins baby, um, she immediately apologized very strongly and I thought very uh, sincerely, uh, to me it seems sincere, saying that she had not understood the implications of that phrase. More recently, she has not backed down from uh, saying that, suggest making statements that many critics think um, uh, go back to an old trope and meme that is anti-Semitic, namely that Jews have this allegiance to Israel and therefore are disloyal to whatever country, other countries they're living in. She hasn't backed down from that, but you know, on the positive, it's been an opportunity to discuss the issue, to shed light on the issue. I've spoken to students on campuses who weren't even aware that um, this is at least potentially a problem. So it's had, it's been a teachable moment among other things. Please. Climate of like, anti free speech, for instance, by like having safe spaces and trigger warnings and like these terms of microaggressions. Like, I feel like those kind of things um, make people feel like they have a right to not be offended, and that should like allow you to tell people to stop talking because you might feel offended. Um, do you think that because of these safe spaces, like universities, like kind of helping with this whole? Uh, anti-free speech thing? These are such excellent questions, and let me say something, which is, if we had time, I sincerely would love to hear what each of you thinks about the questions that you're asking me. And the only reason I'm not saying, well, what do you think about that, uh, to each of the excellent questioners is just for lack of time. I think I can infer what you think about that, and I share your concerns that um, this rhetoric of um, concern uh, 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 suggests that you have a right not to be offended, and you're exactly correct that there is no such right in the United States, and there also is no such general right in Canada. Uh, and one of the reasons is that that is such a subjective concept, and, and that's essentially the core of my objection to censoring hate speech, you know, because when you look at the statutory definitions in Canada or elsewhere, it's a specific kind of offense, right? You are disparaging or demeaning or dehumanizing or degrading on the basis of who the person is. And, and when you have such a subjective concept, it basically means that it is completely up to the discretion of whoever is enforcing that standard, and I put standard in quotes, to basically pick whatever ideas they dislike and to silence them. And that's something that is completely inconsistent, especially with the mission of a university where we should have the most robust free speech and be and learn to be exposed to, to analyze, to criticize, to dissent from offensive ideas. Uh, but it's not going to do us as individuals any good or our democracy any good to protect us uh, from that offensive speech. I was just reading, I, um, before I came here, I just saw the headline that uh, Twitter has adopted a policy where it's, it, it, it recognizes that, Don, it was using Donald Trump as an example, but it would apply to many politicians, that um, they've got these newly re 
enforce anti-hate speech standards on their platform, like many social media companies, and they are acknowledging that what Trump and other politicians say violate their hate speech standards, but they are making what they call a public interest exception, that it is in the public interest to hear those ideas. And in some ways, what I'm saying is, I think there should be a public interest exception for everybody, because if somebody has hateful or discriminatory thoughts, I would rather know about it than drive them to the dark corners of the, of the internet. Trigger warnings, I think, I would oppose a university telling a professor you may not use it, just as I would oppose a university telling a professor you must use it. There was a recent study that was done, and apparently it was one of these meta studies. It studied the impact of trigger warnings, and it concluded that they do absolutely no good at all. Uh, experts on trauma and PTSD um, concur that the, it's counter to somebody's mental health to shield them from exposure to the traumatizing event, that what works from a therapeutic perspective is gradual under the aid of supervision of a mental health professional to gradually be re-exposed to whatever the traumatizing experience was. So I think they don't do any good from a mental health point of view, but I think from a pedagogical point of view when students um, are nervous and anxious, I, can, I would defend the right of a professor to choose to issue one. I think I probably would not do it myself. Uh, Ash, do I see you? No, I'm sorry. Uh, please. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to have to lay this uh, like context for my question out a little bit, but I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I obviously don't, just to be clear, I don't agree with uh, what I'm about to say. I'm just explaining it just for context. Um, do, are you familiar with uh, Herbert Marcuse's essay, Repressive Tolerance? Yes, I read it fairly recently. Reread it fairly yeah, recently. Okay, just a brief uh, explanation for those who don't know. Herbert Marcuse was the philosopher of the New Left back in the 1960s. His, in the essay, he basically argues that free speech is in and of itself oppressive because uh, society is not equal. There are some groups that are marginalized and some who are more powerful, and as a result, if you allow free speech, the uh, more powerful groups will oppress the others, and in a quasi-Marxist manner, he frames this uh, as being conservatives, like the right wing of politics are the oppressors, progressives are the uh, are uh, the oppressed, and thus liberating tolerance, as he calls it, would mean intolerance to views from the right, but tolerance for views on the left. I'm not kidding; those are his you exact did that words. very good summary. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So my question is like. And I disagree with this view. I mean, it's misguided, but you're obviously the professional here. What would your response to his argument be? Because the idea of you have to be intolerant towards the intolerant has taken off in a lot of really left-wing universities. Uh, yes. I mean, I, I have two basic responses, one of which is that, that, that I've already given, but let me put it, rephrase it in this somewhat different context, which is that um, who is going to be enforcing these standards? It's going to be, by definition, those who have power. And so, of course, and this, since the standard is so vague and subjective, they're going to enforce it in a way that tends to perpetuate their power. So it seems to me that if you accept his premise, it disproves the vaunted solution of um, censorship. And it could be that you know, he was making more of a theoretical argument. I don't know that. I, re I did a debate not too long ago um, where um, somebody who is a supporter of Marcuse's philosophy was actually the moderator. And he said, and I was de debating somebody who also supported his philosophy, and the moderator said, well, I think from a theoretical point of view, the other guy wins. But from the point of view of practical real world politics, Nadine wins. And he said, because I think practical real world politics are more important than theory. She wins the debate, period. Uh, so I've never understood how this critique as a real world matter. To me, it seems self-defeating of the argument in favor of censorship. Um, the other major comment I would make is that 
In some ways, it proves too much because people who have more money and more power um, have more, ha can enjoy every right more than the rest of us. To take the most dramatic example, life itself. As a, you know, I, Canada doesn't have the death penalty anymore, but my, right, my country does, unfortunately. And as even the warden of a, a prison um, said recently, why do we call it capital punishment when the only people who get it are the ones without capital? I mean, every single study has shown that you control for everything else about, you know, the evidence and the mitigating circumstances and the aggravating circumstances. Um, the single biggest differentiator, I mean, well, unfortunately, race is one which tends to correlate with, uh, with economics, but overall, wealthy people who can hire the best attorneys and investigators don't get the death penalty and poor people do. It's a, it's a travesty and it's a tragedy and all of us should be working zealously to make sure that the enjoyment of all fundamental freedoms, including freedom of speech, is equally available to everybody. And in my book, I make a big point about this, that um, we have to make sure that we are deploying and investing resources, including education and access to technology, to empower everybody to be able to raise his or her voice uh, on all issues, but certainly to speak against hate speech. And this is one of the positives of social media, that it is very inexpensive and it really has enabled um, very liberatory movements to take off that could not have existed without it. We hear so much about the negative and, and that's very important, but we would not have had a Black Lives Matter movement. We would not have had a Me Too movement. Um, we would not have had a lot of other positive social justice movements. So there is an underlying problem, but the solution is not censorship. Uh, Priyank. Uh, so in the uh, province of Ontario, as of uh, January 1st, we had a provincial law come into place that uh, basically mandates all uh, publicly funded post-secondary institutions have to uh, have a version of the Chicago principle. So the like, European University has it, and uh, um, all the universities have adopted it. I mean, our club is actually, we're, it's great we're able to be part of that process with the government and with uh, our university. Um, and I think as of recently in the United States, uh, there's supposed to be an executive action or it's, uh, or it's already passed where they're basically mandating universities to also have a version of the Chicago principles. So I just wondering what you think about uh, sort of the government telling uh, you know, publicly funded schools that they have to follow the Chicago principles and protect freedom. Well, one very good thing happened as a result of President Trump's executive order, uh, namely a major university in the United States in order to show its compliance with and support for free speech principles, uh, earlier this week decided that every single incoming student had to read my book. <laughs> so I'm all in favor of these. I, I'm being facetious. Um, it's interesting, my, in, my immediate reaction and that of other free speech activists, uh, individuals and organizations in the United States was the very same that I've seen from much of the free speech community here. Number one, that the devil is in the details, right? We really have to see how these laws and orders are going to be enforced. Uh, number two, that even though it sounds very positive, how could we oppose a commitment to free speech? Um, there's a real source of anxiety here for government to use its power, including the power of the purse, to enforce a specific concept of free speech. Because um, free speech, especially when you're talking about multiple speakers with multiple perspectives, some of whom are exercising their right to protest, some of whom are exercising their right to counter protest. How do you draw the line in a particular situation to maximally protect 
all voices and all perspectives. And different reasonable civil libertarians could disagree with each other. Let me just give you one really concrete example. So my, my bottom line is I would rather trust university officials in consultation with students and faculty and staff to come up with standards, to enforce the standards, because they have a big tradition of academic freedom and basically a culture. For all of the incidents that are problematic on campuses, I do think that free speech is more alive and well on campuses on the whole than in the rest of society. And I certainly trust university personnel more than I trust elected officials. That's just my instinct as a civil libertarian. Uh, certainly Donald Trump and uh, for what I know about the premier of Ontario are not people who have stellar free speech records in general. Uh, so one could suspect that um, the concern is only about certain perspectives that are being silenced. In the United States, for example, uh, Trump has actually said that people who burn the American flag, which the U.S. Supreme Court has repeatedly held, is constitutionally protected under the First Amendment. But Donald Trump said they should be deported and lose their American citizenship, just to give one example. So if he doesn't like the speech, it's, you know, he's not going to care. He's going to want to violate it. Um, uh, but um, I, I, I'm sorry, I was going to make another point. On, uh, in terms of, um, I, I wanted to give you a concrete example of where reasonable people could disagree about where to draw the line. We had an incident in New York last spring of a, and it was very distressing to me as a law professor because lawyers, as I said in response to an earlier question, one of your questions, on the whole, lawyers do tend to get the neutral principles that are at stake here. So when we started seeing efforts to suppress speakers on campuses in the United States, it took a long time before those efforts reached law schools. And a lot of us thought, well, that's because in law schools, students understand that you have to be exposed to different perspectives. Among other things, you can't be an effective lawyer unless you do that. But unfortunately, we started to see some incidents on law school campuses. And this was a law school in New York, a city university of New York. It was a conservative speaker who was talking about um, executive orders on immigration. And he was shouted down. He uh, videotaped the whole thing on his phone. And you can see that for about a half hour, he was completely surrounded by students who were shouting with bullhorns and was unable to say a single word. He was amazingly composed and calm. I mean, they were really quite intimidating. I would have felt intimidated if I were in his face, but he, he really preserved his composure. And they left after a half hour, and he then started talking. He didn't feel capable of addressing the subject that he had originally been asked to talk about. He had been rattled enough to be thrown off that. But I think he opened it up for students to ask him questions. And the dean of that law school decided that that was not a violation of his free speech rights. She decided that that was, uh, the protesters were exercising. It was not sufficiently disruptive to, to constitute a substantial disruption and therefore she was not going to punish it. I think that reasonable people could disagree about that. Um, would I want the government to be coming in and saying, if you draw the line, we think it should be 20 minutes rather than a half hour, or 10 minutes rather than 15 minutes, we're going to withdraw your funds from you? I think that's, that's scary to me. Uh, second round there, please. What do you think about Facebook's uh, recent decision to ban uh, white nationalists, white separatists, as well as social networking websites who kind of implement methods to curb free speech online? So if you're like right when talking about shadow, shadow banning and how you know their subscribers can't find the content, that you see this on Twitter, you see this on Facebook. So I just wanted to know what you th think about uh, social media, social media um, implementing curb um, methods to curb free speech. 
because these standards are, I put it in quotes, are so subjective, you have the same problems with social media that you have with governments. And that's one of the reasons why they're constantly changing their policies, because people will point out problems with the policies that they're enforcing. I do completely defend their right as private sector companies uh, to exercise their own free speech rights to decide who is going to have access to their platform and what ideas are not going to be on their platform. Just the way uh, a major newspaper, traditional media, doesn't have to allow everybody to be published and doesn't have to allow every idea to be published. So that's an exercise of their own free speech rights. However, as a practical matter, uh, the United States Supreme Court recognized in a case a couple of years ago unanimously that social media now constitute the overwhelmingly dominant platform for communication, for exchange of ideas and information, not only among ourselves and with our friends and family, but also between individuals in a democratic republic and government officials and candidates. So for all practical purposes, if we don't have robust free speech on these social media platforms, we're not gonna have it anywhere. And that's the worst of both worlds because they are, for practical purposes, exercising more sensorial power than all the governments in the world throughout history added together, and yet we don't have any way of making sure they are doing it in a fair way. And let me give you a number here. I did the research for my book in 2017 and that it went to press. And I, so as of 2017, so this is an understatement, I'm sure it's increased, one company exercising its power to censor one type of problematic speech uh, in one month. I'm talking about Facebook enforcing its anti-hate speech policy in one month, two years ago, said that it is taking down each month 288,000 allegedly hate speech posts per month. So I mean, the power that we're talking about is off the charts and it is not being exercised in a way that is positive from the perspective of minority groups or anybody who is challenging the status quo. Uh, there are repeated complaints from civil liberties and civil rights and human rights organizations that uh, even the hate speech policies are being enforced against Black Lives Matter, uh, native pipeline protesters, people who are protesting abuse in the criminal justice system, and that conversely, those who have political or economic power, going back to the Marcusean point, are getting a free pass. Um, and part of it is, is just the, the, the subjectivity, uh, whether you're using algorithms or whether you're using overworked and overwhelmed human content moderators, they have to make a split second decision. Um, one very big complaint from members of racial minorities in the United States is that uh, when they are subject to hate speech, including online, and then they'll, they'll, they'll complain about it to their friends and say, look, you know, this speech is, is out there um, and please, you know, give me support and please denounce the, and sympathy and please denounce the message. Uh, so they're repeating the hate speech for those constructive purposes. In other words, it's counter speech, but the social media can't tell the difference. So people who are complaining about hate speech and seeking support against it are themselves punished as for engaging in hate speech. So it's a very, very difficult problem. And uh, the best answer that I can come up with, having thought about it a lot and talked to a lot of other people who are working on it, is at the very least, we need to have some kind of 
procedural protections because right now the social media companies are not giving us their criteria and they're changing constantly. We get some information, some is leaked, but a lot of it is completely um, secret. We don't know what their standards are. And people are complaining that when they get blocked or even removed, that they're not given the reasons and they're not given an opportunity to appeal. And there's no independent um, uh, judgment there outside of the company that has financial interests overall more than human rights interests. So a big coalition of free speech and human rights organizations mm -hmm. have come together to craft these procedural type human rights principles for at least constraining the power uh, of censorship by the social media companies. Uh, Ash. Can you uh, discuss uh, what legal principles uh, there are in parallel between hate speech laws and hate crimes? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, so, as I said earlier, hate speech is not a legally recognized concept under U.S. law, which simply means that there is no category of speech based on its hateful content, which therefore is unprotected under the First Amendment. But hate crime is a recognized legal concept. It's sometimes called bias crime. And that is an act that is justifiably punished as a crime completely independent of any speech or idea associated with it. So an assault on a person, vandalism of property. The concept of hate crime or bias crime says when you commit an assault or vandalism uh, and the victim is intentionally singled out because of a discriminatory reason, you know, you commit vandalism against a mosque because you're discriminating against Muslims or against a synagogue because you're discriminating against Jews or you uh, commit an assault against a LGBT person because of discrimination, that that can be treated as a more serious crime on the rationale that it does more harm to the individual victim, to the group to which the victim belongs, and to society as a whole. And therefore, it, the law is justified in imposing uh, an enhanced or increased penalty on it. Uh, Reasonable civil libertarians have had strong debates about whether that's a justifiable concept. I think uh, I come out in favor of it, uh, but I think there are plausible arguments against it. Anyway, more importantly, the United States Supreme Court uh, said that that concept is consistent with freedom of speech. So. Uh, most states in the United States do have these laws. Now, whether they're effective, um, that's another story. Okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions. And the gray shirt, please. So uh, I think we've, we've gone around this point a few times. You brought up again uh, true threats, harassment, mm -hmm. bullying, those things are again where the US draws the line on speech and do, like, again, literally constitute uh, restrictions on it. Um, and I, I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of curious again how uh, you think of again a, a lot of I guess arguments against restricting other forms of speech. A lot a lot of uh, the, the forms that are used I guess are not necessarily logically broken when it, if one were to try to apply them to again true th threats relating to violence or incitement. Um, so I, I'm just kind of curious how you might elaborate on this kind of distinction. And again, you know. Uh, as, as you said, you do believe that, you know, generally while you distrust the government on many of these matters, you are okay with it stepping in in these sufficiently extreme cases. Exactly. If I can, uh, one of the epigrams to my book it comes from Harvard Law School professor Zechariah Chaffee, who wrote this at, in the first half of the 20th century, but it's still true today. He said, the real issue in every spe free speech controversy is this whether the state can punish all words which have some tendency, however remote, to cause harm, or only words which directly 
cause harm. Now, admittedly, there's always going to be some subjectivity, even in enforcing the strictest standard, but the more strictly you define the standard, the more you cabin government's discretion. And um, in fairness, I have to say that some of these standards really are only hypothetical. I mean, for example, Oliver Wendell Holmes famously gave the example of, and most people get it wrong, most people say you cannot shout fire in a crowded theater. That's wrong. If the theater is on fire, you want people to shout fire. So you cannot falsely shout fire uh, in a crowded theater. And um, so there are very, very few cases in which any of these standards actually has been deemed to be satisfied, uh, uh, which is important. Uh, that said, I think that, uh, and I'm going to correct myself, I mean, on the intentional incitement, I think that's a very hard standard to satisfy. Uh, on true threats, sadly, that is something that does manifest itself, including on college campuses. I personally think, although I've had disagreements with other free speech advocates, I think that uh, Charlottesville satisfied the true threat standard when the demonstrators were not only chanting the most repugnant messages, you will not replace us, Jews will not replace us, I absolutely loathe that message as the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. Even if I weren't, I would loathe the message. Uh, but where they, they, in my view, crossed the line to a true threat was when they were uh, marching en masse, brandishing torches that were lighted and brandishing firearms. So I think that satisfies the standard of intending to instill a reasonable fear of harm on the part of the audience members to whom it was directed. I, I, and by the way, correctly, the law does not require that they intended to carry out um, any violence because if you reasonably fear that they will, that already inhibits your freedom. I would not have exercised my right to be there and certainly not my right to be there counter protesting in the face of those facts and circumstances. So I think that was a punishable true threat. Okay, I have one last question. We will be able to stay a little bit after, for, but in the, uh, I think, blue shirt or purple shirt in the back. <laughs> um, so my question is for in this era of like fake news where things are online and they're published and they're just they're not accurate, um, what role do you think that free speech plays into legitimizing untrue knowledge? The circulation of it. I think that here again, it's a very serious problem and another example of harm that speech can cause. But here too, censorship would be uh, far worse than depending on education and uh, counter information to, to rectify the problem. We actually have examples of other countries that have uh, passed laws to against so-called fake news and propaganda, not only authoritarian countries, but also one or two democratic countries. And surprise, surprise, any speech that is inconsistent with the government's view of the facts um, is a subject to punishment and stifling as so-called fake news. Another really important issue here is I've seen many studies, I suspect you have too, that show that when people have certain deeply held beliefs, they are impervious to change by virtue of even knowing that the so-called facts are wrong. They believe it because of some loyalty to the person with whom that idea, or the politician with whom that idea is associated. So even presenting different information 
or depriving them of access to the false information is not going to change the basic problem, which is this rigid tribal loyalty that does not admit of different perspectives. So in some ways, that goes back to the question over here about how do we break down that kind of tribalism and get people to, to speak across those deeply entrenched battle lines. Thank you. I think we could go on for a lot longer. Uh, Nadine has been on a grueling uh, speaking tour for the past year or so. Uh, she's done two events for us today as a, a morning event in New York, so a very early flight back tomorrow morning. Just going to wrap it up there. Uh, we will be around. Uh, I will be selling books. Nadine will be around to sign books and, and ask a few questions one-on-one uh, -on -one for, for a little bit. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming and the great conversation. Thanks for uh, York Students for Free Speech for, for hosting the event. And thank you, Nadine. And thank you for your great questions.